Hello, I'm Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm head of Bluestack Productions, the publisher of Irish Environment, an online magazine covering environmental matters on the island of Ireland. And I'm very happy today to be here in Belfast at the headquarters of the Northern Ireland Environmental Link. Uh, and I'm sitting here today with Sean Kelly. Hello, Sean. How are you? Hello. Good to see you. Thank you. Sean, coming. now, uh, what, what is your, you work at uh, NEIL, N-I-E-L, and what is your role there? Um, well, after many years of looking after sort of policy-related issues, uh, my role here is I'm now development manager, um, and what that really is is trying to work and develop along with our members projects and ideas that can help fulfil our policy objectives okay. um, for for our member organisations. And now, besides your involvement with the uh, with Neil. Um, there, you're also involved with a, a special project which is formed recently called Nature Matters Northern Ireland. Yes. If you could tell the audience just briefly, what is that Nature Matters Northern Ireland? Well, <clears throat> just to take it back a little, as I said, we're, we're the umbrella, and NEIL is an umbrella organisation for environmental NGOs. But then with the arrival of uh, the decision of the UK to leave uh, Europe, the Brexit vote, um, we also set up a, a working group within NEIL called the NEIL Brexit Coalition, and it brings members all together to work on various uh, issues to do with Brexit. But because NEIL, uh, an organisation, is not by design public, uh, public facing, organization mm -hmm. we decided that it'd be quite good to set up a public facing wing called nature matters and that's basically just a way of informing the general public and mm -hmm. other interested bodies about issues in relation to it, the environment and brexit so we just call that the nature matters ni campaign okay and uh, within that uh, nature matters campaign is there an area which you focused on there, there there are a number of different areas uh there are a number of different working groups once again made up of members and each different uh working group has a lead mm -hmm. um there is a sustainable uh, land use group folks mm -hmm. a lot obviously in agriculture there's a fisheries and a marine group there's a nature and environmental protection group mm. and then there is uh, an international advocacy or a cross-border group that is the group that I that I lead on that's okay. the group that I the current group. and within that group it's not just Northern Ireland environment like members but also members of uh, Irish env uh, pillar environmental pillar in the Republic of Ireland as well so okay. we, we deal with the cross-border issues and that's what we'll be talking about today and mm -hmm. one of the core concepts within the cross-border uh, activities is is the notion of the island of Ireland as a single biogeographic unit. Yes. That's a mouthful in a way, yep. but give us a simple explanation of just what that means. Well, what we're basically saying is that the island of Ireland, as you say, is a single biogeographic unit. What does that mean? We share common landscapes, common habitats, species, common geology, common water uh, catchments, marine catchments and stuff as well, and also, uh, as I said, flora and fauna. So because we are an island, it all, therefore we're arguing that things in relation to the environment and all the things we've mentioned has to have this all-island uh, dimension to it. Okay. All right. And now, uh, with Brexit, uh, let's talk a little bit about where there currently is cross-border uh, cooperation on environmental matters based on uh, EU legislation. Mm -hmm. Just in a, in a broad sense, where does that happen? Right across the board, um, mm -hmm. and that includes, uh, as I said, in relation to say, like the freshwater environment, yep. we have water catchments uh, as part of the Water Framework Directive. Uh, you have river basin, river basin districts, etc. There are four that are relevant to Northern Ireland, but mm -hmm. only one totally in Northern Ireland. The other three are cross-border in, 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 in how they're set up. So mm -hmm. exactly, so if we're doing with something in relation to fresh water and one part of the river, then you need to worry what's happening on the other side in terms of a separate member state. Which, sorry, what's, what's the one internal uh, basin? Uh, northeast, I think it's, it's, it's the Northeast River Basin District. Basically, it's the North Coast. Basically, uh, in North of Ireland, basically the bit that's closest to Scotland. Ah, okay. that sort of, the, rest of them, the rest of them are like the Nabon, etc. And, the, and the, they're all cross-border region. Okay. But that's just fresh water, the same as the shared marine environments as well. Mm -hmm. There are cooperation around those, there's cooperation around a number of our um, protected areas under the Birds and Habitats Directive mm -hmm. or cross-border sites, physically mm -hmm. cross-border sites as well. There is a cooperation that goes on in relation to waste um, and to wildfires. 
yeah. uh, which has increasing, become an increasing problem with climate change and, and other issues. Um, also in relation to, there's an all-island uh, pollination plan or pollinator plan. Uh -huh. um, there's also issues around, for example, um, air quality and energy. We have a single uh, energy market, north and south. Mm -hmm. So basically, Everything it encompasses just about everything to do with the environment. Now, what what uh, you mentioned waste? How is there? What's the cross border uh, issues with regard to waste? Well, uh, in waste there is that the illegal waste dumping. There's both. There is both. There has been. Um, there is within member states, etc. You're allowed to do have cross border treatment of waste, and that is and mm -hmm. that is something that currently takes place here. A lot of waste goes across the border in terms of recycling mm -hmm. uh, from the south into the north, and I, I think vice versa as well. One of the issues that we've had is the movement of illegal waste. Mm -hmm. um, there have been, for example, I think just a few years ago, they found a massive site up by uh, up in the Derry Donegal border, really, but up in a Maboy Road up there mm -hmm. um, and the hundreds and thousands of tons of, uh, of illegal waste has been moved up so there has to be that cooperation both mm -hmm. in terms of the legal waste but also the fact that some of it is uh, crime related you know gang related etc etc people mm -hmm. are trying to to make money out of, out of regulation I think a lot of that case a lot, a lot of that uh, waste came from uh, Dublin um, mm -hmm. uh, originally but there was there's other sites as well it's just the, the Maboy site as I refer to is mm -hmm. is uh, Arguably one of the biggest in Europe in terms of, of in terms of problems with illegal waste. And and they're actually, if I recall, in some instances they're repatriating the waste <coughs> right from that, the north to the south or vice that, versa. That, that that is correct. I mean, one of the issues um, I, I mentioned the single biogeographic unit and how it makes sense. Mm -hmm. One of the things that come out of the Good Friday Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, obviously a, a political uh, agreement between the UK and Ireland and also the heavy. Uh, influence as well of the European Union mm -hmm. but within that they set up structures cross-border structures like mm -hmm. the locks agency etc um, but that also included um, the north-south ministerial council mm -hmm. and that north-south ministerial council has a number of different areas of cooperation mm -hmm. one of which is the environment so therefore when you mention the repatriation of waste mm -hmm. this was work that was undertaken by and overseen by the uh, those involved in the environment in relation to the north south ministerial council mm -hmm. basically it's ministers from northern ireland and ministers from public of ireland and mm -hmm. uh, high ranking civil servants etc so mm -hmm. they were part of this finding the or part of this repatriation plan to make sure that both uh, both separate member states were happy with how it was being dealt with and how it was being progressed all of these things are still driven have been to this point by European directives okay and that's really where the benefit is is because the standard has been the same the north and the south in terms of what it is we have to try to achieve as indeed mm -hmm. with other parts of Europe as well mm -hmm. and that's really where difficulty lies now in relation to say where it's marine or protected habitats or or water quality mm -hmm. what if now what it seems a reasonable case there's going to be that there will be a divergence mm -hmm. And this is one of the issues that we have been raising in, in, in the group that I mentioned that I lead because we have to try to get our message across to the Doyle mm -hmm. and our message across to Westminster and we've also been trying to get our message across in Brussels as well mm -hmm. in terms of the environment is not something that can just be, <coughs> you know, we'll deal with that later, we'll deal with it. And assumptions that it's going to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Our problem, what we fear is that is if there's a divergence, mm -hmm and these rules and regulations that are put in there currently by Europe, then we will have different standards. Mm -hmm. And those standards could lead to, for example, maybe a lowering of the environmental standards to try to get an economic advantage, right. or how do I, if we're working different standards and different sides of the border, well, how do you achieve your standards if I'm working from different, considering, mm -hmm. as I said, we've maybe got the shared waterway, or we've got the shared habitat, or we've got this protected species. Uh -huh. You know, how, do, how does that work? So that, that, that's something that we're very concerned about at the moment. Now, now Sean, uh, how, does, how does the cooperation on these cross-border aspects of, of protecting natural resources actually work i mean do the, do the is it minister to minister is it agency to agency is the are, what role does the <coughs> N N ngos uh, yeah. such as neil and uh, the, the network in the south have i mean yeah. th you have an example that you could give with the audience of one of these cross-border projects well i mean 
it, it, the first thing to say is it's sort of like at all levels um, mm. now it, what I'm saying for example there was a lot of work was done by the departments in terms of invasive species strategy mm -hmm. or, or a, a strategy looking at pollinators because it was, it was a, we were losing our pollinators basically um, particularly bees etc as well mm -hmm. so where it made good economic sense good environmental sense and just was a natural thing to do the departments have worked together in that now they work together formally this being Northern Ireland Environment Agency in the north and primarily National Parks and Wildlife Service in the south but other agencies as well mm -hmm. um, they have worked together with structures and put in joint funding etc particularly for the invasive species Ireland websites and the updates etc etc uh, mm -hmm. that. so that is a where there's very much a common interest um, now, on saying that, the other thing that has to be a closer across a huge range of areas. In terms of that, you also things have local government and stuff as well, where you would have particularly if it's local government or a county council, the Republic of Ireland around mm. the border, and those on the northern side of the border are working together around particular habitats or species or whatever it is as well. Mm -hmm. The same would basically go for the environmental NGOs as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things we have is we have our um, structures within Northern Ireland Environment Link and our working groups, and they look at agriculture and planning, and they look at fresh water and marine, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that uh, what we do is we try to match up as best we can uh, with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland as well, because they're going to have interest groups that are looking at those as well in mm -hmm. terms of trying to work together in, 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 uh, in common projects. Now, in the uh, forgetting about Brexit for the moment, mm -hmm. we'll come back to that, um, but as it exists now in terms of the cross-border cooperation that is based on the e European Union laws, mm -hmm. and that, what, what do you think is needed to improve that? I would say now, ironically, even following Brexit, whatever way Brexit ships out, it's a single biogeographic unit and we really should be able to say and work upon what's going to be best because if we can do stuff here that's good improvement say for hen harriers here mm -hmm. well that's going to be a knock-on effect in the Republic of Ireland and vice, vice versa. Water quality in the south going mm -hmm. to be approved for all those reasons. So I think there needs to be a new recognition um, of the single biogeographic unit among our politicians and mm -hmm. that needs to be resourced and that is something we're worried about at the moment as I said it is because once this interreg program goes out, and that's just one of the programs, there's other programs, mm -hmm. Horizon 2020 and, and Life, etc., as well, the Life program, they all have environmental, uh, the other purely environmental programs are also elements of environmental uh, support to them. Mm -hmm. Once they go, we don't know what the future is going to be. Right. And then, of course, just to add on to that in terms of cooperation, without an executive and function Northern Ireland government at the moment, even in regards to allocation resources for anything, we don't know how that's going to pan out. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's an interesting issue that, for the audience's mm -hmm. sake, that, that there has been no uh, actual government functioning here in Northern Ireland since January of 2017, mm -hmm. um, because there was uh, they they dissolved the, they didn't dissolve it formally, but they've just kind of walked yes. away from the devolved yes. administration. And what kind of problems has that created for you? I mean, forgetting Brexit, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what kind of problems has that created for you uh, well, on cross-border issues? Well. I mean, if I just can briefly refer to, come back to oh, Brexit sure. for a moment, simply because there's an overlap on them, but uh -huh. one of the things about that is that, so if you go for Brexit at the moment and what's happening and what the future deal is going to be about and what means this and what that means, etc. Mm -hmm. One of the problems we have, of course, is we don't have any government input into that from Northern Ireland. So mm -hmm. if Westminster is talking to Scotland or talking to Wales or, or trying to talk to Northern Ireland and get their opinion from their ministers what they want, well in Northern Ireland we don't have that because we don't have any ministers. Mm -hmm. So we have the problem, this leads on to the wider issue now, in terms of at the minute it's our most senior, senior civil servant, we have a permanent secretary within the Northern Ireland, it's the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Mm -hmm. And he has to go and try to give opinions and try to nudge things in certain directions, but he can't do so with any degree of certainty mm -hmm. because he's not a political representative. He's not allowed to take those decisions. Mm -hmm. So he goes as a senior civil servant here and sits with ministers elsewhere mm -hmm. and gives ideas and opinions, but can't say this is what we want and this mm -hmm. is what we need. Now, now Sean, do you... Do you um with the absence of a minister, do you find that you get uh, uh, more uh, accessible uh, relationships with the uh, with the uh, civil servants who are in charge of the departments now? I mean, has that opened up that door for you in a way or not? Well, 
I would say to some extent, yes, it has improved simply because we find ourselves in a situation that if it's to do with agriculture, environment, whatever it is, the department has to ask people, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and, and they're good at actually having a very good, very good uh, framework so far for trying to get the structures in place to try mm -hmm. to mean that it can have an informed opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that, you know, th that's something that they've been good at, but they only can take it so far. Now, um uh, one of the things that we haven't touched on yet, but I think would be worth exploring a little bit, and that is that, uh, is there any particular aspect of cross-border issues in terms of the enforcement uh, under the EU laws? I mean, what, what enforcement uh, powers are there under EU law to deal with cross-border projects or problems? Well, the thing about mm -hmm. it is, in, in terms of even in terms of regulation and then enforcement, but before, as I said, we had this common European framework, which mm -hmm. meant, well, they're the standards. You know what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You know how you have to improve water quality. You know what you have to have a, a, a list of uh, damaging invasive species and action plans to stop it. So we knew, we knew they were there. Mm -hmm. And one of the main uh, ways to appeal if something wasn't being done in terms of a directive or whatever, a European directive, was the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. And you can complain to the European Court of Justice, anyone can do in any member state if they say, look, these are the rules and a member state or my government or whatever is not following those or they're breaking those or they're not designated in these areas or they're not protecting, they're not enforcing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if that was the case, you took that case to the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice, it's quite a long process, I admit, but it can result in fines that are hundreds of thousands of pounds per day mm -hmm. if you're found to be in breach. You know, now they give you written warning and it's a long procedure, it's not just like starting from the day. And then they continue to fine you until the position has been remedied, mm -hmm. which could take a while. Um, but the problem we have now in terms of enforcement is is that, well, once again, if we leave Europe, then we're leaving that structure behind us as well in terms of who do you um, mm -hmm. complain to. Right. Now, Northern Ireland is, I think, along with Greece, is the only part of Europe that doesn't have an independent environmental protection agency. Mm -hmm. So when I mentioned Northern Ireland Environment Agency before, they are a government agency that sits within a government department. Right. Uh, so part of our problem is in terms of Northern Ireland we're thinking is well look if we don't have an independent environmental protection agency mm -hmm. and we don't have the European Court of Justice we don't have Europe to go to to say hold on mm -hmm. we think there's a breach here or something's not been done uh -huh. where what do we do where do we go mm -hmm. and at the moment we don't have an answer to that, that one, yeah. now uh, Sean let me ask you in terms of the the enforcement uh, on a cross-border but has there ever been enforcement action taken in Northern Ireland with regard to a cross-border project uh, I, or problem? As I said before, there's a lot of stuff that's going on as regards waste, um, uh -huh. where the countries have decided, you know, like this has to be sorted out through the North-South Ministerial Council. They've agreed there's priorities and how they're going to deal with it and uh -huh. who's going to pay okay. for repatriation and right. where the costs are going to come from. Right. So that sort of enforcement right, sure. uh, has course, been there. But part of me would still argue that maybe a lot of that enforcement is that they have done that because if you fail to do so, you could be in breach of European right. uh, directives. Right. That's, you the know what I mean? so that's the that, that, That's the thing at the back. So well, this right. has been brought to our attention. Right. There's a real problem here. This is how we'll deal with this. You do this. You do that. You right. know. The, the, I think that tends to be how, how it's done. Now, are, 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 I suppose maybe to end it all, it's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, are you optimistic about anything coming out of Brexit in terms of uh, better protections for Northern Ireland? I mean, they, there there is the suggestion by some people that Brexit is an opportunity mm -hmm. to enhance it, but, but many I think of us would probably believe there's much more dangers mm -hmm. of vested interests chipping away at those things. And there may be opportunities, and sh an opportunity itself could be that if, if CAP wasn't performing well for mm -hmm. the environment, there mm -hmm. may be an opportunity to replace it with something better. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have an idea of what that framework will be, what that structure will be, mm -hmm. what you have to do to get that agricultural money, the levels of it, and what the environmental aspects are going to be, mm -hmm. then it's very difficult to be optimistic mm -hmm. or positive about something until you say, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's have your, if I had a wee bit more detail on what the plan was meant to be. Mm -hmm. Now, Northern Ireland, in terms of environmental governance, Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of uh, its care for the environment ha has been very, very, very poor mm -hmm. for 
decades. It has been uh, none of the political parties, uh, none of the bigger political parties have actually took it and run it. So I think the environment is often seen to be something that's there to be exploited. Mm-hmm. Exploited in terms of using its resources or whatever, or something to build houses on or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and if it remains a devolved matter, which I think it should do, but if it remains a devolved matter, um, well then, where's the indication that these people and their political leaders will have a brighter, better right. vision. Right. The most we can say, given the uncertainties about Brexit, the uncertainties about when there's going to be government, is you keep your fingers crossed, but keep your feet busy. We, we will see. It, it, it seems yeah. to change day and daily, yeah. and I think we're all sort of in that position, no matter what level of Northern society in. So we're, we're doing our best to make it as a greener Brexit as possible. That's great, great. Sean, thanks for talking with us. Thank you very much indeed.